Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know that you are, you have come to this event from all different parts of our planet, ladies and gentlemen. As director of FHI Civil Society Peace Building Department, it is my distinct pleasure to open on my own behalf and that of FHI these brief proceedings celebrating the 25th birthday of the NGO, as it used to be called in COSI, Sustainability Index, and its newest issue. Um, in, in thinking about, you know, the, <clears throat> the opening of this celebration and this event, I looked at the, and I don't know if you can see it, the first issue, um, or the first iteration of the NGO Index, which was covered only Eastern Europe in 1997. It had, the index had, then had only five dimensions. And I was um, actually involved in, in, the, in the creation and also in the um, assessment of Poland at the time. You know, the, the times have changed. Um, democracy is no longer on the march. Um, and the index has grown much larger and now covers 70, 72 countries and the dimensions and, and, and a and far greater number of dimensions. Um, so I look forward to the discussion about, you know, the last uh last year and the difficult um events that accompanied it um but before we we move on i need to thank all the people who made this event possible um and uh first of all ekai merlishvili who is the project director um and william daly who worked tirelessly to bring all of you together and to uh, make sure that things go go smoothly i also need to thank our editor extraordinaire Jennifer Stewart and our partner of ICML and our partner ICML for all her hard work on this report and of course I need to thank our 72 partners from 72 countries all over our planet um, um, for working with us their patience on this complex um, uh, undertaking and then fine last but not least I need to thank our USAID partner and especially Tina del Castillo um, and with that, I would like I would like to uh, introduce our relatively new um, CEO, Dr. Tessie San Martin. She's been uh, FHI CEO, I think, for about a year. Um, <clears throat> you know, she has had a distinguished career. I'm just going to mention here that she, in addition um, to her work on in, in, in nonprofits and a variety of posts, she's been published by the Times and the Post. She has a doctorate in political economy from Harvard um, and a bachelor's degree from, the, from, from our own Georgetown School of Foreign Service. And with that, I give you Dr. Tessie San Martin. Thank you. Great. Michael, thank you for that um, introduction. And uh, let me start by welcoming everyone to this virtual launch of USAID's 2021 Civil Society Organization Sustainability Index. And I'm very pleased to be here with you uh, for the second uh, time. I, I want to reiterate what Michael said, congratulations to the CSOSI team for really uh, what has been an incredible 25 years of work. Back at the beginning, as Michael was talking about, in 1997, the index covered only 18 countries in Central and Eastern Europe and Eurasia. This last report, covers 73 countries uh, in the 2021 index, a sign of its value to local civil societies in countries stretching from Mexico to Timor-Leste. Um, and I, I think that index is uniquely, uh, it's unique and uniquely valuable. It's one of the few global publications of its kind where local implementing partners lead the process and write the report. Uh, some of the index's local uh, partners have worked on this for over a decade. We're especially happy to have them join us today as both panelists and participants. Tools like CSOSI are critical to civic actors around the world. The report helps civil society organizations self-assess the advances and the setbacks across seven key components or dimensions. It helps CSOs and those who support them better assess their needs, target activities to improve the legal operating environment for them so that they can better serve the most vulnerable groups in their country. 
We hope that tools like CSOSI remain available and accessible to civil society, governments, donors, uh, practitioners, uh, and anyone interested in civil society. Um, and I cannot help but think, and Michael alluded to this, right, but I cannot help but think about the parallels between the time in which the CSOSI was launched and today, 25 years ago with the collapse of the former Soviet Union, um, you know, Central and Eastern Europe emerging from the shadow of the Iron Curtain, as it were, it seemed like a new age of democracy was upon us. Much has happened since. And one of the things that we have learned is that while democracies are resilient to attacks, their survival is not guaranteed anywhere. Uh, so this brings us back to the index. The health of civil society is essential to the health of democracies. The work uh, putting together these CSOSI reports carried out across the globe brings attention to the health and therefore the sustainability of the sector. Uh, a strong civil society is essential to addressing issues like corruption, impunity, inequality, and violence, all of which, if left unattended, uh, over time erodes citizens' faith in their governments and weakens democratic institutions here and abroad. Um, and I also think, you know, Administrator uh, Samantha Power's vision of locally led development, which emphasizes that local voices must be at the center of programming, um, you know, to, to advance that vision, a strong civil society is essential. There can be no uh, sustainable locally led development without strong civil society institutions. So I hope that you find this year's CSOSI reports insightful and useful in your own work. This is FHI 360's fifth year supporting the index and um, the launch of the CSOSI reports. The report this year covers the 2021 calendar year, as I said, and includes four regional reports. Initially, these index reports were launched in person here in Washington, DC, where I'm based. But for the past two years, we've gone virtual. Um, uh, you know, in part by necessity uh, due to COVID, but, you know, we found that it is that this virtual arrangement makes it possible for FHI 360, USAID Center for Democracy, Human Rights and Governance, and the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, ICNL, welcome participants across time zones and continents. So we're thankful for all of you joining us here to celebrate the launch of the CSOSI reports and to be here celebrating the 25th anniversary of this effort. Um, uh, I, to, to reiterate what Michael said, thank you uh, to all of the individuals that were involved in this production. It was a real team effort across FHI 360, our partner organizations, ICNL, USAID, and all the local organizations and civic groups around the world that have, that have been engaged. So enough um, chit chat. I uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to open this. And now I have the privilege of introducing uh, today's keynote speaker, Rosary Tucci, the Acting Deputy Assistant Administrator for Democracy, Human Rights and Governance at USAID, who has had an impressive career working in international affairs and is a dedicated public servant making sure that, that the world is a more stable and peaceful place. So please join me in welcoming Acting Deputy Assistant Administrator Tucci to this virtual stage. Great, thank you so much, Tessie. I assume you all can hear me okay? Okay, great, thank you. Let me just jump in. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here to celebrate the 2021 launch of CSOSI, um, but also to celebrate the 25 years of the index. Um, of course, I wanna add my thanks as well to all of our partners. Um, we've mentioned this a few times, but um, worth mentioning again, FHI 360, ICNL, our in-country partners, of course, editorial committee members, um, and, and from on behalf of aid, uh, our regional bureaus and missions, I know have all worked together to make the index uh, such a success. Um, and let me also thank our panelists um, who really have a wealth of expertise uh, in, in thinking through the most challenging problems facing civil society and 
also um, inspiring us and sharing the resilience of, of civil society um, in tackling these uh, uh, this era's unprecedented obstacles. I hope we'll, that's that's what I'm looking forward to hearing more about today. Um, so again, just really grateful for this opportunity to reflect on the trends uh, impacting civil society um, around the world. Um, I think you know Michael and and Tessie both mentioned um, you know we're in the 25th year of this index. Um, tracking the trends uh, most important to the health of civil society. Um, really, from our standpoint as well, the index has evolved uh, tremendously since it, since it was initiated, um, not only in the dimensions uh, that both uh, Michael and Tessie mentioned, but also um, in the range of civil society um, actors um, that exist, whether that's formal, well-established CSOs to grassroots, unregistered groups, uh, and active civic minded individuals and and that really captures I think um, the full range of of um, of players and and stakeholders in civil society also the regional expansion I think is a testament to its success uh, covering Africa Asia Mexico and of course Middle East and Northern Africa um, which um, I believe celebrated their 10th uh, 10th milestone recently. Um, and I could, you know, I could say firsthand, you know, having worked in the center um, for several years previously and back again, I've seen this index um, used as an important tool to guide how best we support, uh, we, we can support civil society. Um, you know, more broadly, it's helped us prioritize our assistance. And of course, more specifically, it's informed our program design. Um, so I just want to thank you, uh, you know, for the direct guidance that it has provided. Today, I, I'm looking forward to hearing the 2021 um, findings uh, from the report. Um, and I think there, there's definitely going to be some uniquenesses um, in this report uh, because of the critical role that civil society is playing in tackling some really uh, immense global challenges out there. Uh, again, continuing the COVID-19 response, um, various economic and political instability, but of course also addressing climate change, all those issues, meanwhile, while defending democracy. Um, so really just a, a full plate out uh, uh, full plate there. Um, and I know that you know going forward the, the production of the reports will be slimmed down a bit uh, for 2022. Um, as, as Tessie said, as, as aid shifts to more locally led development and less centralized management, uh, but be assured that we remain committed to supporting locally led dialogues and engagement on these important issues. And we really do expect that our USA missions and local partners will continue to monitor and track uh, the, the challenges and opportunities for civil society organization stability um, and sustainability for years to come. Um, just know that more broadly at AID, we are doing everything we can to elevate the importance of credible, informed, proactive, and protective protected civil society. Um, as Tessie said, the foundation of functioning democracies. Um, in many ways, I think we can all agree that civil society is more important than ever. Um, as I mentioned, with the uniqueness of the challenges both to democracy, but also to development um, occurring globally. Um, you know, we've been really at USAID and the USG more broadly have been you know, working to rally and stand behind other democracies in the range of partners through the summit, the year of action. Again, we're looking towards the next summit um, and just looking at this as an opportunity to continue to elevate the challenges and opportunities confronting civil society. Um, we've tried to do that um, in our Powered by the People initiative, again, looking at expanding support to the diverse range of actors in civil society. Um, we could talk more about you know, what that looks like, um, you know, direct and accessible support to local and grassroots actors to foster their resilience and agency, looking at regionally focused responses. Um, and of course, you know, obviously wanna take this platform uh, take this opportunity and this platform to invite you all uh, to join in a co-creation that we'll be doing this spring um, related to, to Powered by the People, um, looking at ways um, to really also to stand up a multi-donor fund. Again, thinking through how do we get more support to this sector? How do we rally more partners around this response, knowing what the challenges are as articulated in these CSOSI reports? 
Um, so feel free to visit um, our website, usaid.gov, um, to learn more about how to participate in that. Um, we're also trying to take advantage of, of several of the platforms out there, again, to lift up these issues. Um, uh, we're partnering with uh, Norway and the Czech Republic, and of course, ICNL, um, critical partners in, in hosting the democracy civic space cohorts. Again, another opportunity to just uh, push for robust commitments and impl implementation of support um, to and protection of civil society. So let me just wrap up there, um, just again, to say we've learned so much from these um, from these reports and the CSOSI process. We've gained and built, uh, worked with all of you to, to strengthen our partnership, uh, many of you here today. We're so grateful for the critical information that again, I, as I said, has really informed our work and not just USAID's work, but the work of academics, other development actors, and really local organizations in different countries and regions around the world. Um, we know how much work it is to put these reports together, um, the, re the research, the compiling, the analyzing, and so just are so immensely appreciative to all of you for that hard work. And again, thank you to our partners, FHI 360 and ICNL um, for, for giving this platform for us to discuss these challenges and then into how we enhance our support in response. So let me hand it back over. Um, and again, I look forward to hearing the, the findings today. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Stewart. I'm the project manager and long uh, standing editor for the index at ICNL. Um, I've got the honor of highlighting some of the trends we saw in the 2021 reports. First, I just want to thank the other speakers for providing such a great uh, framing of what we're going to be talking about for the rest of today. Um, if we can start the slides. Go ahead to the next one. We go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so this shows some of the covers of the index over the years. Other speakers have talked about the history of the index a little bit already, starting in 1997 in a limited number of countries in Europe and Eurasia. Uh, by 2000, it had expanded to 28 countries in Europe and Eurasia, including the five Central Asian countries. And then it began to expand beyond Europe and Eurasia in 2009 first to 19 countries in Africa, and then in 2011 to the Middle East and North Africa, Afghanistan and Pakistan, followed by Asia in 2014, and Mexico in 2018. And we now cover 72 countries. And just to make sure that everybody's awake and paying attention, we're going to have a quick pop quiz. We can pop the poll up. I thought it was, um, in reflecting on the 25 years of the index, I thought it was interesting to calculate how many individual country and territory reports that have been published as part of the index since 1997. Um, and so everybody should see a poll on their screen. And if you can just uh, quickly check off what you think the number of reports is that we've published over the 25 years, um, just to see out of curiosity what people think. And I think we can go ahead and close the poll now and see the results. So um, a fair distribution of guesses here, um, but the majority of people chose 1,162, which is indeed the correct answer. Um, this translates to about 11,000 pages of material, and it's, so it's really documented the history of civil society over the past quarter century, and I think this is one of the things that has really made the index unique over the past 25 years. So we can close this out and go to the next slide. So before discussing the trends that we saw in 2021, I wanted to make sure that everyone has a basic understanding of the content and methodology of the index. I know I see a lot of familiar names on the participant list, but there may be some of you who are new to the index. Um, as we've discussed, the index uh, reports annually on the strength and viability of CSO sectors around the world. And it covers, each report covers seven key aspects or dimensions of CSO sustainability, which are shown here. Next slide. The index's methodology really centers local ownership and empowerment and provides an opportunity for local CSOs to step away from their day-to-day -day work and look at the overall environments in which they operate. 
The country reports are developed through a collaborative process, beginning with a local partner that organizes an expert panel consisting of CSO practitioners and experts. The panel assesses and rates the dimensions of CSO sustainability during the year, and this serves as the basis of a report drafted by the local partner, which is then reviewed and approved by an editorial committee. The production of the reports is a participatory process. Uh, for these 2021 reports, over 800 people were involved, the vast majority of which are in the field. Um, others have already thanked the many people involved. I want to echo that. Uh, I want to thank the many local partners who are involved, many of whom I see on the call today. I want to give out a special shout out to the other editors, Marilyn Wyatt and Kate Musgrave, who we could not do this product without. And uh, also thank the team at FHI, including Eka Emerly Shvili, Alex Najadian, and William Daly, who managed the complex process and put together today's event. Next slide. The index utilizes a seven point scoring scale in which a one indicates the most robust level of sustainability and a seven represents the lowest level. Dimension scores are averaged to produce an overall sustainability score for the CSO sector of a given country. And the scores are organized into three basic categories. Sustainability enhanced is the highest level of sustainability and includes scores from one to three. Sustainability is the lowest with scores below five and in between is sustainability evolving with scores from 3.1 to five. Next slide. I think it's important to stress that score changes in the index tend to be quite incremental. This chart shows the basic definition of score changes that we apply across all country reports. So as you can see, a 0.1 change is slight, a 0.3 is significant, a 0.5 is transformative or cataclysmic. Given these guidelines and the fact that these dimensions measure sector-wide changes, the vast majority of scores in the index change at most by a 0.1 or 0.2 in a given year. Next slide. As Acting DAA Tucci mentioned, uh, this report covers 2021. Uh, so we have to put our time travel hats on for a bit. I know it's already the end of 2022. The world has changed a lot uh, quickly in recent years. Um, so just as a reminder, 2021 was indeed a very difficult year. It was, of course, the second year of the pandemic. Most countries and regions experienced several waves of infection during the year. In some countries, the virus actually hit harder in 2021 than in 2020. So for instance, Indonesia had nearly seven times the COVID cases and deaths in 2021 than in the previous year. Governments in most countries eased and, re and imposed restrictions to control the spread of virus in response to the rate of infections. But the good news was the vaccination started to be rolled out. However, widespread inequalities in access to the vaccinations as well as vaccine hesitancy, which was often fueled by misinformation, kept the vac vaccination rates low in some countries and regions. The pandemic also continued to have an impact on the economy. While GDP started to rebound in some regions, inflation and employment were high everywhere. Um, several countries were affected by extreme climate conditions and natural disasters during the year. Timor-Leste, for example, was struck by tropical cyclone Soroya. Various countries in sub-Saharan Africa were affected by droughts, cyclones, and flooding. So this is an ongoing issue that we've been seeing, of course. And politically, national elections were held in 14 countries covered by the index, which sometimes led to traditional parties losing power, as was the case in Iraq and Morocco. Other notable political developments include the first democratic transfer of power through an election in Niger, and coups in Guinea and Sudan. Finally, many countries covered by the index continued to be affected by conflicts and insecurity. Uh, Yemen, for instance, continues to be continues to be beset by internal conflicts and terrorist and insurgent attacks continue to be a problem in countries like Mozambique and Kenya. This brings us to our second pop quiz of the day. We can pop up that poll. So considering the situation in 2021 and how difficult it was, I'm curious what people anticipate, um, how people anticipate that overall CSO sustainability changed on a global basis. Do you think that more countries reported improvements in overall CSO sustainability than deteriorations? More countries reported deteriorations than improvements or about the same number of countries reported improvements and deteriorations? So again, if you can just take a second and click your best guess. And I think we can go ahead and close the poll out and see the results. Again, pretty pretty split. 
Um, we had 26% believing that there were more improvements, 44% uh, believing that there were more deteriorations, and 29% believing that it was about the same number of countries. So let's take a look and see who was right. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So in this case, actually, uh, the minority who chose that more countries reported improvements and deteriorations were correct. It was a difficult year, but CSOs really rose to the challenge. Um, this map shows how overall CSO sustainability changed between 2020 and 2021. Green indicates countries where overall CSO sustainability improved. Yellow shows countries where it didn't change and red shows countries uh, where sustainability deteriorated. And overall, despite the challenging circumstances during the year, we saw overall CSO sustainability remain the same in 41 countries, but it improved in 20, while it only deteriorated in 11. This is the, a significant difference from the situation the previous year, when half as many countries had improved scores and almost twice as many had worse scores. Next slide. As indicated earlier, changes in index scoring tend to be minor. This combined with the fact that overall CSO sustainability scores are calculated by averaging the dimension scores together mean that it's particularly rare for overall CSO sustainability to change by more than 0.1 from one year to the next. So I wanted to highlight just a few cases where bigger changes were noted in 2021. The biggest improvement was seen in the Gambia this year, where overall CSO sustainability improved by 0.2 points. And it's improved by 0.8 points since 2016, when Yaya Jame, who had ruled the country in an authoritarian manner for over 20 years, was unexpectedly defeated in presidential elections. Over the past five years, Gambian civil society has regained its voice and become a leading player in national affairs, recording transformational improvements in all dimensions of CSO sustainability. On the other hand, Belarus saw the biggest deterioration with overall sustainability dropping by an unprecedented 0.3 points in 2021 alone. Belarusian CSOs, of course, have long operated in a restrictive environment, but following the rigged presidential election and a crackdown on the ensuing protests in 2020, the government further clamped down on society in 2021, including through a concerted campaign to liquidate CSOs. It's estimated that up to 200,000 people have fled the repressive environment in Belarus since August of 2020. This has led to a unique situation in which, while there is still a somewhat vibrant Belarusian civil society, it operates almost entirely in exile, while independent civil society within the country's borders have been largely eliminated. Overall, CSO sustainability also declined by 0.2 points in both Uganda and Burkina Faso. In Uganda, the deterioration was driven by growing authoritarianism, while in Burkina Faso, chronic insecurity and unceasing attacks by extremist groups were the main drivers of worsening conditions. And I think all of these examples really show how the context in which CSOs operate really affect sustainability. Next slide. Given how dramatically the world changed with the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, I also thought it would be interesting to compare how overall sustainability in 2021 compared with the pre-COVID situation in 2019 to see how much the improvements in the past year were truly improvements as, as opposed to a return to normalcy after the difficult year of 2020. Looking at this two-year trend paints a more complex picture with roughly equal numbers of countries reporting improvements and deteriorations. Um, so looking at this two-year time horizon, 21 countries improved their CSO sustainability, including seven countries that improved in 2020, but then remained stable in 2021, and 20 countries deteriorated. And this includes nine countries that deteriorated in 2020, but stayed the same in 2021. Next slide. So where does that change leave us? Uh, this map is taken from our CSOSI Explorer, and it shows the stage of overall CSO sustainability for all 72 countries covered in the 2021 edition. Um, as you can see here, the majority of countries have scores falling in sustainability evolving, which is the middle category of sustainability. They're shown in various shades of yellow. Just seven countries, which are all in, the, all in Europe and joined the EU in the first big wave of expansion in 2004, were in the highest category of sustainability enhanced, which is shown in green. 
And then there are 16 countries that are still in the lowest category of sustainability, sustainability impeded, that are shown in orange and red, including nine in Africa, four in the Middle East and North Africa, two in Europe and Eurasia, and one in Asia. As has been the case in previous years, both the highest and lowest overall CSO sustainability scores are found in countries covered in the Europe and Eurasia editions of the index. So Estonia has the highest score at 2.1, while Belarus and Azerbaijan are tied for the lowest overall CSO sustainability score of any country covered by the index with scores of 5.8. Next slide. Uh, now I want to take a look at some of the dimension level and cross-cutting trends that we saw. This chart shows average scores for each dimension by region. I want to start off by acknowledging that averages mask a great deal of variety within individual regions, such as the fact that in six of the seven dimensions, both the highest and lowest scores are in countries covered in the Europe and Eurasia edition of the index. But that said, a few trends emerge from looking at these averages. First, Europe and Eurasia has the strongest average score in all seven dimensions, which is not surprising given that the majority of these countries are long-standing EU members with stable democracies, robust economies, and vibrant civil societies. Second, financial viability is the weakest dimension in all four regions, while it's the second weakest dimension in Mexico. This is also not necessarily a surprise. Generating local support, whether from government, businesses, or individuals, really requires a transformational shift in culture and is additionally complicated by the difficult economic environments in many of the countries that the index covers. The picture is less clear when it comes to the strongest dimension. In MENA and Africa, it's advocacy. In Mexico, it's sectoral infrastructure. And in E&E, these two dimensions share the highest honor. Asia is a bit of an outlier with organizational capacity coming in as the strongest dimension. And I think this variation um, and these particular dimensions raise some interesting questions about the impact and focus of donor programs that would be worth exploring. Next slide. So let's dive deeper into what we saw in a few of these areas, beginning with the ongoing closing of civic space. For years, the index has documented the closing of civic space an issue that ICNL is obviously very involved in. This phenomenon is reflected in several dimensions of the index, but is most directly tied to the legal environment. This map shows the dismal state of legal environments governing CSOs in 2021. As you can see, there's a lot of red and orange on this map. In total, 28 countries had scores for this dimension that fell in the sustainability impeded category. And unfortunately, the situation continued to get worse in 2021 with 26 out of the 72 countries reporting further deteriorations in their legal environment scores. Next slide. In 2020, we also saw quite a bit of deterioration in the legal environment um, in actually an even greater number of countries. These were largely driven by restrictions imposed in response to the pandemic, with some governments using the health precautions around COVID-19 to repress and silence government critics. The use of pandemic measures to silence critics continued to be an issue in a few countries in 2021. In Thailand, for example, which reported the largest deterioration in legal environment, the emergency decree passed in 2020 to limit the spread of COVID was repeatedly extended and used to ban nearly all public gatherings in the middle of 2021 with significant penalties for violators. Despite this, protests continued to be organized, and in August alone, at least 260 protesters were arrested for violating the decree. However, the use of specifically pandemic-related restrictions to clamp down on critical voices was less common in 2021 than in 2020. Instead, we saw government shrink civic space in other ways, including through broad restrictions on the freedoms of association, assembly, and expression. Belarus and South Sudan are extreme examples of how governments intentionally restricted the freedom of association in 2021. As already mentioned, in Belarus, the government undertook a concentrated campaign to liquidate CSOs. During the year, over 300 organizations were forcibly liquidated and another 200 decided to self-liquidate. In addition, CSOs were subject to raids and inspections, as well as allegations of financial irregularities and tax evasion, and civil society activists were detained or criminally prosecuted. As a result, Belarus's legal environment score fell to 7.0, the lowest possible score on the index's scoring scale. 
Similarly, the government in South Sudan delayed renewals of CSO operating licenses, shut down or froze the bank accounts of several organizations, and arbitrarily arrested or expelled CSO activists and journalists, also giving it a score of 7.0. Um, it's worth noting that both of these scores would have been even lower if our scoring scale allowed it. Freedom of assembly was also widely restricted, with many governments denying permits for protests, arresting or detaining protesters, or using excessive force to disrupt protests. In Tunisia, for example, a spike in COVID cases, together with a continued political standoff between the president and prime minister, sparked widespread anti-government protests that involved violent clashes between police and demonstrators. Finally, freedom of expression was limited in many countries. In Bangladesh, for example, the government lodged over 1,000 cases against journalists and alleged government critics under the Digital Security Act, which was a nearly ninefold increase compared to the previous year. Next slide. The news in 2021 wasn't all bad, though. CSOs across the countries covered by this, this edition of the index continued to make great strides in service provision and responded ably to local community needs. As a result of these efforts, service provision is one of the strongest dimensions of the index, and 18 countries recorded further improvements in 2021. Uh, given the ongoing state of the pandemic, CSOs continued to effectively respond to needs directly arising from COVID-19, including the provision of food, PPE, and medicine, as well as assistance with vaccination campaigns. In Tunisia, for example, two national days for vaccinations were organized in August, with 400 uh, centers across the country that were managed largely by CSOs. Through this effort, more than a half million individuals received vaccinations in a single day. CSOs also responded to other humanitarian crises. Lithuanian and Polish CSOs, for example, responded to a humanitarian crisis on their borders that was orchestrated by Belarusian authorities. They provided humanitarian assistance, monitored the situation of illegal migrants, and advocated for migrants' rights. CSOs also expanded their work in other areas. In Zambia, for instance, which reported one of the larger improvements in service provision in 2021, CSOs increasingly provided legal services to various audiences, including civil society activists who were arrested for conducting peaceful protests or expressing their opinions on governance matters. Next slide. In addition to responding rapidly to pressing community needs, CSOs showed their resilience and adaptability through their use of various online platforms. Uh, this is also reflected in several dimensions, including organizational capacity, financial viability, sectoral infrastructure, and public image. As was the case around the world, CSOs adoption of digital tools helped them adapt to the remote working arrangements, again, necessitated by pandemic conditions in 2021. As we're doing today, CSOs use tools like Zoom and Microsoft Teams to manage their work and organize both internal and external meetings, discussions, and training sessions. CSOs also use social media platforms and other digital tools to maintain and build relationships with their stakeholders and constituents. The Albanian Network for Rural Development, for instance, consulted online with 500 stakeholders to design and advocate for new rural sector governance policies. The increased use of digital tools also advanced the use of crowdfunding, primarily in Europe and Eurasia. Um, in North Macedonia, the first crowdfunding platform for CSOs specific to that country, called eCrowd, was launched in 2021. Increased use of technology also fueled advances in the infrastructure supporting the sector, particularly by enhancing CSOs' access to capacity building opportunities. In Sri Lanka, for example, the CSO hashtag generation provided technical support and training for grassroots organizations on the use of social media to engage with constituents and promote their activities. And finally, CSOs increasingly use social media to promote their public image. In Mexico, Alternativas y Capacidades launched a social media campaign through the hashtag Si con la Sociedad Civil, sorry for my Spanish pronunciation, to highlight CSOs work to promote and defend human rights as well as their efforts to strengthen civic space. Next slide. Finally, I wanna discuss advocacy. 2021 was a largely positive year for advocacy with 27 countries reporting improvements. What's particularly interesting though, is that the vast majority of countries with improved advocacy, 21 of the 27 were in Sub-Saharan Africa. So you can see that large swath of green around the outside of Africa. 
Even more noteworthy is the fact that this is the fourth year in a row in which more than half of the country is covered by the index in Africa reported advances in advocacy. Over the past few years, countries including the Gambia, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Namibia, and Sierra Leone have reported transformational improvements in their advocacy scores. There are two aspects that are considered in the advocacy dimension, the extent to which CSOs engage in advocacy campaigns and the extent to which governments consider such input in their decision making. And African countries recorded advances on both of these fronts in 2021. CSOs engaged actively in advocacy initiatives during the year, often achieving notable successes. Advocacy by CSOs, CSOs in Niger, for example, resulted in the lifting of a ban on motorcycles, the reopening of markets, and the mitigation of other measures related to the state of emergency. Um, CSOs started to use strategic litigation effectively, and there were successful examples reported in the Gambia, Gabon, and Botswana. African governments were also more willing to take CSO seriously as partners and interlocutors, with several governments even increasing contact with CSOs and actively soliciting their input. So for example, the Burundian government took the initiative to arrange meetings with CSOs, while the new military junta in Guinea arranged four days of consultations with civil society. Slide. So I've really only been able to scratch the surface of the rich information and data contained in the 2021 editions of the index. For those of you who are interested in delving deeper into the data, I encourage you to visit our CSOSI dashboard or Explorer, an interactive website that you can find at CSOSI.org. Um, here you can find all of the historical and current scores for the index. You can also find all of the individual country reports, both for 2021 as well as previous years. Uh, in the coming weeks, the regional reports, which also include executive summaries that delve into some of these trends in more detail will also be uploaded. And some of these are already available on um, FHI 360's website. Before signing off, I just wanted to ask one more polling question. Uh, if we can pop that up. So I'm just curious what aspect of the index uh, our participants are most likely to look at after this event. Uh, are you most interested in looking at scores, country reports, the regional executive summaries, or more details about our methodology? Again, we'll just take a second for people to pop in their selections. I think we can probably close that out and see the results. Um, so people are mostly interested in looking at country reports. That's really the, the meat of the index, so that makes sense. Um, but a good number of people interested in looking at the executive summaries and scores as well. So I hope that you find the information on the Explorer interesting. We can close that out. And uh, with that, I'd like to pass things on to Charles Kojo Van Dyke, who will be the moderator for our panel discussion. Charles is a social justice advocate who works to strengthen Southern leadership and citizens participation in development processes in Africa. And he currently serves as the head of the capacity development unit at the West Africa Civil Society Institute or WACSI in Ghana. And he was also a member of our editorial committee for Africa this year. So thank you everybody. Um, turn it over to Charles and the panel. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Uh, as Jennifer said, my name is Charles Kojo van Dijk. I work with Waxi based in Accra, uh, Ghana, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's panel discussion. I'm, I am looking forward to this conversation, and I hope you all are too. Today, our panelists would help us get more insights about global developments and the role of civil society in the late 1990s. So they'll also help us uh, to give a holistic view of current happenings, including the rise of authoritarianism, polarization, and right-wing populism. They will also share perspectives on the empowering nature of informal civil society, or what we call the organic uh, civil society. They will also provide insights into climate change, structural racism, and, 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 and equity. But we cannot end this discussion without looking into the crystal ball to discuss the reimagined future of civil society and civic activism. So it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists who steer today's discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce Muna Bengaga, who's the innovation lead for Civicus and currently heads 
a multi-stakeholder partnership that supports the Innovation for Change Network, which is a community-led initiative that brings together CSOs, technologists, social entrepreneurs, and the private sector to defend and strengthen civic space. You are warmly welcome, Muna. We also have with us Vera Mora, who has been working at OKOTAS, the Hungarian Environmental Partnership Foundation, since 1997, holding the position of director since 2007. Vera has valuable experience in managing and overseeing grant programs of various sizes, including the Hungarian NGO Fund. You're warmly welcome, Vera. It's my pleasure to also introduce Bonnie Dulani, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science in the Department of Politics at the University of Malawi and the Director of Research at the Malawi Institute of Public Opinion and Research, also known as IPOR. Bonnie is also the Director of Surveys for the Afrobarometer, a Pan-African network of researchers who conduct surveys on governance, economy, livelihoods, among other issues. You are warmly welcome, Bonnie. Lastly, we also have Dini Lin Ocampo, who has more than 30 years of dynamic work and academic application in the fields of adult education, community development, distance education, and training. She also has experience in participatory governance, early childhood care, and development. Dini was an academic and policy researcher at the University of the Philippines before joining the Caucus of Development NGO Networks, known as Code NGO, as the executive director. You are welcome, Dini. So I'd like to kindly ask um, that we all try and capture our thoughts uh, between two to three minutes. So thank, thanks so much. So I'd like to begin this conversation with you, Dini. Um, let us go a little back, a little bit back in time. Let us look at the late 1990s. Now, the Code NGO, the organization you head, is the local implementing partner for the CSO SI report in the Philippines. And it's, it's, it's lovely to hear that Code just celebrated its 30th anniversary. So congratulations to you, you. And, and your colleagues. Um, thank but you, can you, yeah, thank you too. Can you, can you help us, can you paint a picture of those times, the late 1990s in the Philippines and in Asia, especially the challenges that code faced responding to the issues of those times. And then it will be great if you could highlight how those challenges compare with the current situation, which is kind of very well documented in the CSO SI reports. Okay, thank you, Charles. Um, when Code NGO uh, was established, uh, when, when Code NGO celebrated our 30th anniversary last year, the country also remembered the 35th anniversary of the 1986 People Power Revolution when mi millions of Filipinos all over the country stood up courageously and peacefully overthrew the dictatorial regime of the late President Ferdinand E. Marcos Sr., the revolution was a culmination of a series of public protests starting decades ago, the assassination of the late Senator Benigno S. Aquino Jr. in 1983, the rigged results of the 1986 snap election, growing social unrest, political and economic crisis and instability, and the hearty support uh, extended by the Catholic Church to the citizens who were marching and reclaiming their liberties. Um, relatedly, uh, in the Southeast Asia region from the late 1980s, uh, authoritarian regimes in the region were giving way to pressures for greater electoral competition and greater activism in society. So after Marcos Sr. was toppled, uh, the fall of Suharto, for example, in Indonesia in 1988 followed. And in the 1980s to the 1990s, the region experienced economic boom and some countries transitioned to democratic governments. CSOs in the Philippines mushroomed since the People Power Revolution of 1986. As international and local funds poured in, countless organizations operated energetically nationwide to protect the values and rights of the people that they represent. Aside from our advocacy work, Code NGO, which was established by the 10 largest uh, NGO networks in the Philippines, 
worked to promote CSO good governance and to strengthen the civil society sector. It held its first national congress, which ratified its covenant on Philippine development and the code of conduct for development NGOs. These are historic declarations that mark the development community's desire to promote its professionalism and to expand the reach and broaden the impact of development work in the country. So on its first 10 years of operations, Code NGO played an instrumental role in setting up two NGO managed funding mechanisms through debt swap agreements with the US and Swiss governments. It also expanded its membership by forming and strengthening regional networks. It also helped establish the Philippine Council for NGO certification, which serves as a self-regulatory body that grants DOLI status for NGOs. However, from 2016 to the present, a variety of threats challenges the Philippine civil society. Year after year, local CSOs generally encountered less access to legal support, difficulty in advocating for issues, and less public visibility and trust. Advocacy, legal environment, and public image deteriorated as both intensified state harassment and pandemic restrictions made it difficult for us to mobilize and engage on multiple issues. Government security forces also labeled specific CSOs as commu communist terrorist groups, a method of blacklisting known in, the, in our country as red tagging. The crackdown on independent media in 2018 and the passage of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 added to the chilling effect, discouraging advocates from expressing their dissent. Consequently, local voices and public outreach diminished and many local organizations tried to stay under the radar to avoid being targeted. Following former President Duterte's attack on major media companies in 2018, CSOs received even lesser national media attention. So that's our situation now, Charles. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's very comprehensive, Dini. Very, very comprehensive. Thank you so much. So Thank I'll just move on to Muna. Uh, and, and, and Muna, interestingly, and, and I'm not sure if you, if you knew, knew, know this, the CSOSI was developed a few years after Civicus was established. And that's the organization that, that, that you work for now. At that time, there were major shifts uh, taking place globally, as well as in South Africa. Um, where Civicus later uh, found a home. So we would like to know, can you just share with us uh, Civicus' perspective of the mid to late 1990s, especially the trends and developments Civicus was seeing emerge? And then we would also love to know the extent to which the initial CSO OSI reports that started in the 1997 onwards uh, covered these kind of developments. Thank you so much, Charles. Actually, I was looking to the to the timeline, and I I think I was in the elementary school by then. Uh, but obviously, those developments impacted my family, impacted everyone. So I I think it's interesting uh, that um, I'm giving my perspective as someone from uh, a generation that maybe did not feel it directly, but um, it's um, uh, uh, my older generation and my parents did for sure in my country. Um, so the 1990s witnessed the fall of two seemingly entrenched political orders, right? The communist regimes in the Eastern Bloc and the apartheid in South Africa. Um, and from Civic's perspective, as you know, we were created as a global alliance for civil society. And uh, by the fall of the apartheid regime in South Africa, um, the, the power of people, uh, the power uh, of people mobilization and the formulation of civil society was one of the most um, uh, attractive uh, side and the strength of um, a global South civil society was key for civil for civicists to move uh, to South Africa. Um, also, at that same period, you can see the, uh, the rise of transnational non-governmental human rights networks 
networks uh, emerging all over the uh, all over the world, intergovernmental regional groups such as you know the Organization for Security and Cooperation uh, in Europe have added human rights to their agenda. So the agenda of human rights has become um, you know entrenched and part of everyone effort. And most importantly for me is that um, democracy and human rights has become interchangeable in international spaces. So you will link, you know, that um, the type of how we treat the human rights as uh, a sign of the health of the democracy in many countries. Um, and one of the example, as I said, in South Africa, uh, after um, uh, you know, the fall of the Fide regime, civil society was one or the main um, uh, entity that responded to the challenges and the aftermath of that. Uh, and one of the biggest uh, role was to fight corruption. And this is um, really strengthened how social scientists back then and policy makers assigned civil society a key role in driving progress, uh, progressive social, political, and economic transformations. Uh, and robust civil society was considered uh, uh, um, a key act, a key important component against a wide variety of social and political ills. One of them is authoritarianism. Uh, uh, one of them is um, uh, bringing the voice uh, of people uh, to the democratic system. It was even widely believed that without a system of association, uh, uh, amplifying individual uh, uh, voices, individual or citizen will not uh, will be less effective in articulating their common interests and identities and social and society will remain politically stagnated and vulnerable to corruption and authoritarianism. However, also at the late of uh, 1990s, I think is really interesting that civil society start to be questioned about its legitimacy, about its positioning, um, about its uh, democratic uh, trans uh, credential. And I think this is was important aim at the growth of anti-globalization movement and the transition of many countries to democracy. So then like if we have democracy, why you need another actor, so third actors to come so that those type of questions start to happen. Uh, and also at the same time, not the, all, the whole world was moving to democracy. Actually, some countries that were resisting this openness and they, um, they, the surge toward this greater um, democracy conversation and human rights often met with political uh, and backsliding nations. Um, example was Pakistan uh, back then, uh, where they were uh, switching uh, back and forth between democracy and authoritarian rule several times. The new generation back then reformed or in, in the Middle East and North Africa, um, uh, also did not have any formal commitment to democracy and human rights. And at the same time in the continent in Africa, the growth of democracy has been hindered not only by the poverty, but also by violent internal conflicts, such what happened in East Africa. So, so with, with, with a hope that civil society, either uh, transnational or global, and also local has like been empowered and has been positioned finally as one of the, those sector or those entity that can support democracy, they've been attacked, they've been uh, uh, questioned. So about the index, I think the index was one timely um, because despite the civil society hype, uh, the understanding of civil society back then uh, in many countries, and especially in countries in the global south, was still limited. So there has been certain growth in descriptive studies, like I, I saw a lot of description about the story of civil society, but really there is no empirical uh, data driven understanding that it can be an evidence based on how we are seeing civil society and the health of civil society. So a major reason, you know, for this lack of empirical knowledge was uh, inherent difficulty in conceptualizing and operationalization of civil society. So the index was one of those tools that other civil society also tried to create such index, but I think the consistency that uh, civil society index created, um, developed by USAID and ICNL and FHI uh, uh, 360 back then, uh, was really key to keep consistent, to create a comparison between the, the states, between the countries. And actually, I'm glad that now the index cover more countries uh, than was in 1997. But I think this is show the relevance of this more evidence-based approaches to how we measure the health of civil society. I think also it was interesting that 
the index included the legal framework and legal environment, because it does not mean that civil society is operating, that the legal environment is friendly enough for it to grow. And, and the last point, what it really, because I get the, uh, I went through the uh, the report of 1997, and I really appreciated that even back then we still talk, like we start talking about the public perception. Uh, you know, now the public's perception for civil society is one of the key issues. Uh, all this counter narrative about our role is it's becoming, you know, actually for the past five years or even more has becoming one of the key issues in civil society, their legitimacy, their reputation, how people perceive them with the rise of digital attacks, uh, disinformation, uh, where that position is. So, um, you know, in, in, in total, I think that, you know, uh, the index uh, you know, addressed issues back then, but I, uh, many of its components are still not only relevant, but I think, you know, it shows the consistency that we need to pay for certain areas such as advocacy, financial access, and for sure, public perceptions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Muna. Thank you so much, Dini. I think for providing us critical insights and a historical journey for this conversation. Um, for me, and I hope for you, it has been interesting to hear how civil society has evolved, uh, you know, uh, in response to the challenges of the times. We've seen that it's a mixed bag uh, in terms of civic space and, 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 and that the sector continues to face threats in terms, in terms of its legitimacy, effectiveness and, and influence. Um, so I, I would like now like to kind of take the conversation to what is happening now, what has happened in the last decade. And I'd like to invite Vera to share a, a specific perspective on this. Um, uh, we, we saw that in, in the 90s, there was some sort of optimism uh, in, certain, in certain spaces in terms of transition to open democracy. But over the last 10 years, for example, in, in Hungary, where Vera is based and works, uh, and else, elsewhere, we've seen authoritarian leaders win elections, We've seen increased uh, restrictions on civic freedoms. We've seen an erosion of social cohesion. Uh, we've seen a backsliding of democratic gains, um, for example, also in, in, in Africa. And then, of course, the pandemic uh, further enabled or emboldened governments uh, to consolidate power through emergency decrees, laws, and, 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 and regulations. So I would like to ask Vera, in the midst of all these kind of very disturbing uh, developments. Can you share with us some um, you know, highlights, some best practices of CSO-led campaigns and interventions that are countering these challenges? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to speak here. And uh, I'd just like to uh, start uh, that uh, my foundation, Ökotash, has also turned 30 this year. We started soon after the uh, changes or the transition to democracy in Hungary and Central Europe in more general. And yes, unfortunately, what you said, Charles, is really true that uh, over the past 10 years, we've seen uh, a backsliding in democracy after the previous uh, 20 years of development. And Hungary is also, unfortunately, the sad example showing uh, that being a member in the European Union is not necessarily a guarantee uh, for maintaining democratic standards and improving uh, the conditions of, for civil society. Um, over the past 10 years, uh, we've seen a shrinking of civic space in Hungary, which manifested in uh, smear campaigns against civil society organizations, harassment by authorities, uh, defunding and even legal restrictions. However, civil society found ways to cope with this situation and found responses how to deal with this situation. And when I'm asked questions, uh, how civil society responds and what it should do in the face of uh, restrictions and attacks, I usually say uh, that they should pay attention to the four C's. And the four C's are communication, constituency, coalitions, and communities. Uh, as regards uh, co co communication and constituencies, Hungarian civil society organizations lived through the first shock in 2014 and 15, 
when a major scandal regarding an important funding tool to Hungarian civil society organizations provided by Norway and other EA countries broke out. Uh, and that was the first uh, when, when the Hungarian government effectively attacked uh, civil society organizations involved in this program, either as grant making organizations or as grantees beneficiaries. And at the time, many organizations, or at least major leading human rights organizations, realized that they need to change um, their strategies and need to change the way they communicate their causes uh, and to gather constituency, a circle of supporters around them, because this can provide them the necessary re resilience in the face of attacks. One of the main lessons of these attacks were uh, that Hungarian people didn't have enough of an understanding why civil society is important, what civil society organizations do, how they are useful uh, for people in general. So this was the task uh, to, let's say, explain, or this was the task to communicate about in order to broaden the constituency of civil society and to gather stronger support by the people. And we've seen over the last, let's say, seven, eight years that more and more Hungarian civil society organizations use, for example, crowdsourcing tools. They turn directly to the people instead of, let's say, foreign donors um, and, and talk to these people and uh, gain their support, both in financial terms and otherwise. Um, and also society seems to be much better understanding and accepting that these organizations need the support of the people um, in order for them to be able to maintain what they do for the people. As regards coalitions, um, I would like to mention here the example of the civilization coalition in Hungary in existence since early 2017. It was brought together uh, by a then draft law uh, discussed by the Hungarian government and later in the parliament, stigmatizing organizations that, rec that receive funding from abroad. And this attack on the whole of the civil sector brought together leading organizations um, that decided to work together uh, to stand up for one another, to strengthen solidarity within civil society and uh, promote a positive image of civil society organizations to the general public. Uh, this coalition, uh, which is now composed of 40 major organizations across different thematic fields from human rights through development organizations to environmental and women's rights organizations, so this, this coalition is still operational until today. And we as members consider it very important to sustain it at least even if, even at times when there are no direct attacks on civil society, at least on let's say a standby, so as to be able to mobilize, um, uh, to come together and to stand up for another when, when times uh, necessity, necessity they that so when, when when the worst time better worst time are coming and finally in communities um it is very important uh, to build communities of active citizens who want to participate in public matters and able to participate in public matters for the, from the bottom up from the grassroots level especially in rural regions not only in hungary i guess but my hungarian ex um, experience certainly proves that and we've seen, for example, uh, the fruits of this kind of um, uh, activism uh, supported by national-wide organizations in the municipal elections in 2019. Prior to those elections in quite a number of um, settlements, locations, not only in big cities, but also in smaller villages, local citizen groups were instrumental in bringing up issues during the election campaign advocating for their causes locally, um, asking candidates uh, to promise to solve burning local issues, uh, to um, encourage people or mobilize people to go to vote, uh, to monitor um, the elections, et cetera, et cetera. And they were quite successful in these efforts, which gave them uh, a lot of, um, well, 
some optimism, but also um, willingness to continue and inspiration to, to mobilize further. Unfortunately, this year in the general elections, uh, their hopes were very much shattered um, and they need to um, again um, reorient their strategies um, and their future directions. However, it was a very important and interesting experience in showing the power of communities of active people. So summarizing, or in a nutshell, um, at this point um, in Hungary, we don't know when political change may come for the better. But I believe uh, civil society organizations are there and will be there and we'll sustain uh, the, let's say, spirit of, the, of democracy, spirit of citizen participation and uh, active citizenship, even in the times to come. Thank you. I hope, you're, I, hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Vera. Very, very, very insightful. Thank you so much. Um, so at, at this juncture, I'll, I'll just want to bring in Bonnie. And, and, and Bonnie, based on, on, on what Vera just shared with, with us, uh, which was very insightful in terms of issues around amplifying the importance and relevance of civil society, uh, strengthening and changing our strategies, looking at solidarity, et cetera. So looking at where you sit and, and kind of gleaning from your work within academia and with IPOR and the Afrobarometer, what are your thoughts on civil society resilience and what you may call an impactful advocacy initiatives that you've seen in, 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 in recent times. So it would, be, it would be great if you could share some of these initiatives uh, that speak to our capacity as CSOs and capability to impact change. And you may share examples maybe from Malawi or from other uh, countries that you have seen on the continent. Yeah, uh, thanks Charles and, uh, and again, uh, civil society, I think as the, my previous speakers have highlighted, we've seen, I think, that flourishing of civil society, especially on the African continent, since the early 1990s, when a lot of countries on the continent embraced democratic politics. Uh, it's fair also to say that in terms of impact and advocacy, I think there's been quite a lot that civil society have achieved. Uh, as you are aware, I think a lot of our governments on this continent struggle to provide sufficient services and reach out to all corners uh, of their countries. So civil society organizations play quite a key role in a, you know, filling in the gaps that uh, governments uh, leave. Uh, but of course, I think in terms of advocacy, civil society organizations have also played quite a major role in various areas, you know, in the social, you know, social advocacy, uh, including, I think, campaigns for free uh, education, uh, better health services, uh, you name it, water, you know, provision of water, and imploring governments to do a better job in these areas. Of course, in the governance arena with which I'm particularly familiar with, we've also seen civil society organizations play quite a major role in, for example, uh, preventing presidents who seek to amend uh, constitutional clauses to uh, stay on indefinitely in office. I mean, in countries like Zambia, my own country, Malawi, uh, Nigeria, uh, among, among many examples, I think we've seen civil society organizations play a major role. We've also seen civil society organizations really advocate for the rights of minority groups in countries like, uh, you know, Mozambique, uh, and Botswana just most recently, we've seen those two countries really, uh, you know, legalize, for example, uh, same-sex relationships following, I think, pressure from civil society organizations. So there's no doubt in my mind that I think civil society organizations have had a major impact, especially in terms of advocacy. In my own country, Malawi, uh, you know, a few years, you know, a few years back now, civil society organizations were at the forefront of who, uh, organizing demonstrations and protesting against poor governance and uh, and uh, flawed elections that ultimately actually led to cancellation uh, of uh, elections. Uh, legal, you know, the courts 
uh, after pressure from civil society organizations decided to allow elections and call for fresh elections. So this just shows, I think, the, the advocacy and the impact that can come from civil society organizations. But of course, we know, and as the report uh, shows, civil society organizations face huge challenges in terms of resilience. And, and I think, especially in the area, because of uh, challenges in terms of financial uh, capacity. Just yesterday, uh, actually, the National uh, Malawi National Regulate, NGO Regulatory Authority, which is an umbrella body regulating operations of the civil society sector, uh, issued uh, a statement, uh, you know, highlighting areas where uh, civil society organizations have failed to comply with regulatory requirements. From a list of 884 CSOs, only 35% uh, we are compliant with the regulatory requirements and about 45% had failed to fulfill their regulatory obligations. And maybe more concerningly, uh, the about 11% of the CEO, CSOs on that list, the, the report says, had, had were dormant in the previous year and another 3% ceased to exist. So we see, I think, civil society organizations facing these challenges, and that even though they are playing quite a major role, some of them are unable to operate, and indeed, some are getting extinct and unable to continue to operate. Uh, so there's kind of a mixed bag, you know, impact, but also challenges that are stand in the way of the operations of CSOs. Let me pause there for a moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Very, very insightful. And it's interesting because I think the next conversation is about, it's actually about how civil society itself, you know, is representing itself in different forms. Uh, and so, like you said, uh, Bonnie, uh, we've been responding to a lot of challenges, climate change, pandemics, the health crisis, uh, providing essential services, doing various campaigns on education, uh, etc. But what we are seeing is that um, the, 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 there are different forms now, and I'd like to bring uh, uh, Muna into this conversation now. There are different forms and models. Some have called uh, the, this informal civil society. Some call it organic uh, uh, civil society. Um, so Muna, I would like for you to share what, what, what are the trends that are emerging around this organic groupings of civil society that are not necessarily formal or legally registered in that sense? Or, or institutionalized, but they are very fluid uh, and, and, and you know, I, I seem to be very much connected with, with, with communities. How do they complement the work of traditional CSOs? We would like to get some insights in that. Thank you so much, uh, Charles, for that um, great question. So from what we've been seeing, um, informal CSOs, whatever it is, movements, grassroots organization, community uh, networks are becoming one of the most effective forms to mobilize people. One, because they are, they are there, they are on the ground, they are responding to the needs expressed by the individuals. And if you referring to back to my answering my fir the first question, that was the essence of civil society. So actually this development of the informal side as we label it, Actually, it's a natural, organic um, uh, evolvement of civil society, because if you are facing uh, uh, a space with uh, uh, complex uh, challenges, uh, complex in all its area, like the introduction of technologies, the, the digital space, how you want civil society to stay in its uh, traditional definition of civil society, whatever it is, institutional or uh, governed civil society. So, um, and I'm sorry, I don't mean governed, but more the institutional side, because, you know, even communities led, they are also governed and they have their own fluid and flexible governance. So one, um, uh, uh, you know, they are becoming one of the most effective form. Second, the trend, they are intensifying, they are becoming more intense. Um, and you can see, for example, in Tunisia, after the revolution, uh, the pop up of community networks and uh, informal sector movements uh, and people mobilization has become one of the biggest trend and ways for, for change, for requesting the change. Um, at the same time, and I think one of the most important trends that I see is the transnational nature 
of these movements. Uh, the Milk Tea Alliance, as an example, um, you know, how these community um, start gathering not only solidarity, but action. Um, and uh, you don't see it in one continent or in one region, but you see it moving to another region. Um, so that uh, transnational uh, nature or trend is showing that um, even though we had some resistance to the globalization in its, you know, form, actually the movement and the informal uh, civil society are creating and are using that globalization. The final um, trends that uh, I think is really important to highlight, and there is many trends, I don't want to say these are only one, is the use of technology and digital space. Um, we can question how effective is the use, huh? because we know that uh, authoritarian governments and other actors, uh, they are using it as well, and actually they are more savvy in using the digital space uh, to shut down democracy and to uh, to um, to hinder you know, f uh, f uh, civil society. But at the same time, civil society are using that and become more effective in mobilizing people and getting their support. <clears throat> and um, and I know I said the final, but um, I think another important point to add is by who is led. What I think is really interesting in these informal spaces is that are led by youth, by women, by indigenous groups, by groups that historically we label them as marginalized or vulnerable. But what is the question of vulnerability if they are on the ground and leading a change? So I think also like these trend that these movements are led by these groups speaks volume of what civil society or traditional civil society fell behind, like to capture these voices, to make them not only part, but it, the space of civil society, it is the space of everyone. And it means that if these actors are now looking for other forms, that's mean that the traditional civil society did not respond to its needs, at least in my humble observations. Um, the best practices, and I want to state, for example, the Innovation for Change Network um, that, you know, I support uh, from my place in Civicus, but there is other stakeholders within the, uh, the ecosystem of civil society that supporting, and how one of the best practices was the co-creation. And you don't limit co-creation. And I know sometimes it has different connotation in people, but the real co-creation that starts by bringing um, uh, and, and being uh, intentional about, about different and diverse civil society and how they come together to build solution together that belong to everyone. And they serve everyone that they've been, you know, they, the group that they designed it or by the initial constituents. So one is how we can make co-creation as part of our uh, values of working, of reaching, of communicating, of governing, and not only designing a product and services. The other part um, that uh, in the best practices is the outreach and the positioning as a trusted partner. Uh, as we all know, and I think you know, we are all vibrant in civil society, there is a big gap and isolation uh, between the informal and the traditional civil society. And one, I think, of the most um, uh, best practices that we need to know is to listen and to position ourselves as the trusted partners from the beginning by supporting with not only financial resources, but non-financial resources. Um, one of the examples that comes to my mind, how a traditional CSOs is a providing security support to movements on the ground. Are they we even doing that, even though we know it is one of the biggest challenge that movements face? How are we mitigating the impact of artificial intelligence on people mobilization or on informal um, uh, groups that are requesting a change on policies? So co-design, uh, trusting partners that actually yeah. co-design, develop it intentionally, um, uh, and for sure more outreach that starts from the beginning uh, uh, and going to the to the to to the level of grassroots and not getting stuck on the traditional level. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks so much for that, Mina. So I, I I think we can't end this conversation by making you know sharing our quick remarks on on the future. Yeah, how do we reimagine CSO's role and civic activism? And I, and I'll I'll love to bring Dini into the conversation and also and also Bonnie and and Vera for you to make some short remarks uh, in your minds. Uh, what what do you think are the key challenges uh, that civil society, both what we've discussed, traditional and informal, should be ready to tackle in the next twenty five years, and how can we leverage on the CSOSI tool 
uh, to, to really strengthen uh, the support we give to civil society in the next 25 years. So, so Dini, I, I would love to hear from you, then from Bonnie, and, and then from Vera. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Um, I'll quickly mention um, three, three key challenges and also very briefly share what we can do. No? Uh, this, uh, this sharing comes from our discussions with political scientists, uh, Dr. Romero, uh, an economist, Dr. Mendoza, and communication specialist, Dr. Sheryl Soriano. First of all, the challenge of scaling up. In the Philippines, a sectoral infrastructure is the one dimension of sustainability that remained constantly stable and present. It could be strengthened in order for a sector to take roots to weather the storms. CSOs must help increase coordination and cooperation within the sector and enable it to bolt in and move as one in crucial initiatives and issues. So uh, to strengthen the existing sectoral infrastructure, CSO sectors can build or expand on the following, uh, like for example, building uh, technical and organizational capacities, growing community philanthropy, and local resource mobiliz mobilization. The second challenge that um, Code NGO thought of is the challenge of disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation. We are addressing the supply side of this uh, phenomena through fact checking, content blocking, holding platforms accountable, but how are we addressing the demand side? The common solution now is media information and literacy. This is important, but a lot of this information operates within important shifts and manipulation of broader worldviews and ideologies, notions of good and bad, and hierarchies of right and wrong. So media information literacy is not sufficient. This information needs to be faced as a problem of civic engagement, more importantly. Lastly, the challenge of building and rebuilding. The CSO sectors can build a unifying narrative around the treasured traditional values of people-centered development, community organizing, and social capital building. We CSOs have been at the front line of these values, the building blocks that supported an active uh, or active civil society for decades. These values are undermined by government's very divisive rhetoric and policies and a penchant for othering that completely undermines unity. CSOs need to recuperate and rebuild what populist authoritarianism through social media has begun to destroy. This alternative narrative can help people understand our role and the public value of our work. It can also help expand the civic space and reinforce our sense of shared belonging and identity. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, thank you so much. So Bonnie, just quickly, um, from, your, from where you sit, what, what, what do we need to prepare ourselves? How do we need to prepare ourselves in addition to what Dini has shared? Yeah, thanks. So, so agreeing with what Dina said, I think just to add that it, maybe civil society uh, can also be a victim of our own success. Uh, in some cases, civil society organizations have become too big uh, and become so disconnected with the people to the point that it, we are so re beginning to resemble the government machinery and all the bureaucracy that comes with that. And I think this is something that threatens, I think, the survival of civil society organizations. Politicization of civil society organizations and political infiltration. We've seen in Malawi, you know, leading civil society uh, leaders and especially the most vocal being incorporated into government and weakening uh, civil, the, the, the civic space. Uh, and so I think issues of accountability. At a point, I think he, when there were a lot of resources going to civil society organizations uh, on the belief that the government was more corrupt and less transparent, we are also getting to hear a lot more stories about the civil society organizations you know, committing similar you know, corruption mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other challenges similar to those of government. So I think there's need, I think, for greater accountability and also regulation, among, even among civil society organizations ourselves so that we can safeguard uh, this space. And I just want to also highlight the value and importance of partnership and the collaboration that 
uh, you know, in my, my language, we say that, you know, as a one head, you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot hold an entire roof of a house. But if you have multiple people, you know, you are able to do that together working as a group. And I think there is also, you know, need for civil society organizations to learn to work together and to collaborate and, and, and really, you know, uh, seek to have much more impact by doing so. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Uh, so Vera, maybe you, you could focus on the, the role of the CSO SI tool in, in helping with this, um, uh, in, in, in really enabling civic activism moving forward. Just quickly, uh, in a minute. Yes, yes, thank you. Well, um, in addition to what was said before, and it also uh, relates to the CSO SI, I think um, it is also quite important um, for the international community, uh, meaning uh, intergovernmental organizations and international organizations to be aware of what's happening on the ground in different countries and to be aware and, and conscious of uh, the signs of democratic backsliding and shrinking civil space. Um, and I think uh, the uh, index is a very important element or tool for that as it provides evidence-based monitoring and documentation of what's happening in the ground in the different countries. Uh, and as such, it is an important tool uh, for the international community um, when they discuss about how um, they can, how the community can provide kind of a safety net to civil societies that are undergoing difficulties in different countries. For example, in Europe, uh, the European Union should be one such actor providing a safety net uh, to civil societies in member states and uh, in third countries, in um, uh, countries where it has development uh, relations with. Um, and uh, therefore, civil society should be raised higher on the European agenda and EU institutions uh, should treat civil society organizations more as allies. That's one of the issues, for example, we are working on. Um, and uh, the index is an important reference point uh, when we are advocating for such uh, purposes. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Vera. Uh, so just before I, 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 I introduce or call on Dini to give us quick closing remarks, I'd just like to say um, there are certain things that I think came out of this conversation, the importance of us amplifying the relevance and importance of civil society. So civil society's intrinsic value to society is important. Uh, we need to strengthen our operational strategies. I mean, we've said this in many ways, both our capacities, but our capabilities. Uh, we need to build trust-based relationships. So there's still an issue of uh, questions about our legitimacy. And then what I love the most, solidarity beyond borders is very important. How do we enable that? How do we also facilitate active citizenship that came up? And of course, the role of evidence. So the CSOSI uh, index becomes extremely important uh, for our work. So Dini, just in two minutes, uh, we're running a, a bit out of time, apologies. If you could just you know, uh, give us a few closing, closing remarks. Okay, thank you, Charles. So first and foremost, I would like to express my appreciation to the US AID for funding the CSOSI for the past 25 years. The sustainability framework, including its seven dimensions, has helped the CSO sectors assess our strength and viability and to determine priority areas that we should pay attention to in terms of our policy advocacy and program development. It has allowed us to collaborate with many individuals and organizations. Thanks as well to FHI 360 and the ICNL for implementing the CSOSI with us your implementing partners in different countries and regions around the world. Coming together today is meaningful and important because creating environments that foster human connections, such as this one, these are the greatest acts of courage and resistance in the face of oppression and difficulties. Citizens, after all, as claim holders, are better able to demand and fight for their rights when they become organized through CSOs. Finally, of course, um, we would like to recognize CSO leaders who are courageous, steadfast, determined, creative, and optimistic. They are gather gathered here right now in this Zoom meeting room. Today, we celebrate everyone who make up the CSOs. Its founders are leaders, staff, volunteers, our partner communities, 
our colleagues in the development sector, in government, academe, business sector, those who are here and those who are elsewhere, and each person who believes in the purpose of civil society for development and for democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dini. Thanks to everyone. And thank you all for attending this conversation. Thank you so much.